I'm actually one that you go by my office, there is, it's not unusual to find organ music playing off my Bluetooth speaker, so I like that. Alinda, I could listen to that the whole time. You could keep playing. No? Oh, you don't want them to be distracted. Yeah, we would be, because that's, uh, that's well done. We appreciate that. We're ending our series today on the one another's, and <clears throat> I don't know, I should have planned it's different, because I don't want to say this is a boring one, because that's like a horrible start to set that in your mind, that this is a boring one, but it shouldn't be. It should be a, a big one. But we had prayer two weeks ago. We had love one another last week, which dominates the one another's. And then to actually have this one, which is encourage one another. I have trouble not thinking that it's just, it's extra. It's like icing on the cake. Yeah, if you can get around to encouraging each other, that's fine. Let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and do that. But that it's not somehow an extremely critical one another, but it is. In fact, if you were to list the positive one another passages um, in the Bible, like, uh, like build up one another or pray for one another, encourage, love one another, there's 22 of them. Then if you look at the 12 that are negative, don't provoke one another, don't lie to one another, there's 12 of them. It's actually kind of interesting that a few of those are the opposite of today's. So it's saying it in a negative way. When we say encourage one another, well, we find out you're not supposed to tear someone down. Well, that's actually saying don't encourage one another again, but now we're using the negative. It really is a big piece. I want you to think again, last time, this is our last one another, think again of the context of your sports team, because these one another's fit. If you think of your family, your work environment, and as believers, it's absolutely and foremost, we're talking about as a church family, the role of encouraging one another. I think one of the greatest examples, and this is in a lot of ways, we talked a little bit about this this last Wednesday night. How many of you have coached a sport? Even if it's just real little ones, you've coached. Let me see your hand. You've coached. Okay. Yeah, quite a few of you. This is a role that coaches are really good at because they can point out something that has to change but they do it in such a way that they're motivated to do it and they're encouraged. Coaches are really have got that figured out because they can't handle a group of people on their team that are all discouraged. Build them up, give them confidence, but keep correcting them. Coaches, great example. So today we're looking at encouragement and maybe we think through a little bit on how we could be better at it in school, at our homes. Heavenly Father, we're asking for that today. If you would, if you'd provide for us some motivation to be more of an encouragement to people around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The passage, and I want you to turn here, and we're going to be flipping around a little bit, so if you have your phone, you can flip maybe easier than the rest of us because you could just type it in. 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. It's an interesting context. 5 is talking about the day of the Lord, the coming back of Jesus. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, then, in this context, he says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that last day when Jesus comes back, that's not going to be with us because through Jesus Christ we have salvation. 
through Jesus Christ, verse 10, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. I don't know what the future holds. You know, it's like we just keep looking at things that happens. And I literally, I'm 57, okay, old man to a lot of you, young man to some. I'll watch the news, and I still, I literally listen to it and think, this is like one of those cheap Billy Graham movies from the 1980s describing what the world will be like someday, and I don't believe it. The conflict, the division, the hopelessness, I'm seeing it, we are, on the news every single day, and we're like, is this real? It was, is this fake filmed a long time ago to scare us? No, it's actually happening. The economy. I have no idea. I looked at the housing prices where we just moved from. House almost doubled in value in five years. You say, oh, that's great. Yeah, it is if you own a house. But if you're just getting out of college and starting your job, good luck. Like, how is this, how is this going to be maintained? As a believer, we're looking at the immorality on television. We can't even believe the things that are… It used to be, it was way back, I, I wasn't, it was a little young for me, but they used to do um, roasting celebrities back in the 70s. I mean, they were, they were really funny. And then you look at the ones today, the roasting on Netflix. It's, it's, a, it's mimicking the same thing. I, I can't even watch it with my own family. It's so raunchy the language, and it's people I love. It's sports figures that I actually have looked up to, and I'm watching this and going, this is normal for us? How has that happened? How has normal today become so bad? Jesus is coming back. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you're doing. Like, hang in there. Hang in there. Jesus is not worried. He's not watching the news going, I wonder what's going to happen in Israel. He's not nervous. His heart rate hasn't changed. It's not like quicker because of everything going on. He's fine. He's seen worse. It's okay. He's in complete control. Encourage one another. Build one another up just as you're doing. You keep your head down and you keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. You and I are called to live a good moral life in our faith in Jesus Christ and be a positive influence on people around. That's our job. Let's do that. The rest of it, I have no idea. But it's not on me, is it? It's not on you. You and I have our own area of influence, and we need to be encouraged to keep up with it, and we're going to trust God that it's going to be okay. He's got a plan. I don't know what it is. It was an interesting observation by the National Institute of Mental Health said that many of our daily conversations are actually mutual counseling sessions whereby we exchange the reassurance of advice that help us deal with routine stress. We go to counseling. Great idea. Many of us have had found benefit in Christian counseling. Go to professionals that deal with it all the time. Great idea. But the truth is, when we interact with one another, we're doing the same thing. 
the Mental Health Association actually saying, no, if we recognized more of that, that when we bump up against somebody, that we use it as opportunity to encourage. We've all heard this. It was a Christian writer, but many others have said, for every critical comment we receive, it takes nine affirming comments to even out the negative effect. You've heard that kind of a, right, teachers hear that a lot. Don't keep doing the negative because for one negative, it takes nine encouraging positive statements to outdo the negative. That's not fair, is it? Shouldn't it be one to one? Maybe one to two. It's one to nine. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you're doing. Uh, Mark Twain said, I can live for two months on one good compliment. We are all broken in some way. Somehow we're broken. Those who don't look like it, broken in some way, somehow. And we all need encouragement. Do you know the name Robert Fulgram? What did he write? Anybody? He's still alive. All I ever needed to know, I learned when. Thank you. You knew that all along, didn't you? (laughs) Yeah, all I ever needed to know, I learned in kindergarten. Here's another great line of his. He's 86, by the way. Yelling at living things does tend to kill the spirit in them. Sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will break our hearts. The value of encouragement, that somehow we could figure out a way, just as you're doing, to do this even more. We had a friend in uh, Cottonwood, the Gots back here, remember uh, Jim Scott, cowboy Jim Scott, just passed away not too long ago. He was a rancher and horse trader up in Jackson Hole. Then got a, tell you how long ago this was, got a bull riding scholarship at Arizona State College, which is now Arizona State University. That goes back a ways. So I'm out on his, on his little ranch with him one day and I'm, I'm talking, he's the nicest guy. Jim and Patty were amazing. And I was complaining at the time about our daughter, Emma. You can join in on that, can't you, Ross? Lots to complain. So Emma, raising Emma, um, strong-willed, doesn't describe it. And so I remember I was complaining with Jim about that, and I just said, honestly, I don't know what to do. I mean, she is something else. She's just got a mind of her own and, and whatever. He said, he says, careful. And I'm like, okay, I'll be careful. He goes, you know, train her, break her, but don't break her spirit. And I'm like, okay, Jim. He goes, no, like this is what then he told me. He goes, I can walk up to a horse and look that horse in the eyes, and I could tell you if it's broken or if its spirit is broken. He goes, I'm not buying one where the spirit's broken. In training horses and breaking horses, you've got to figure out, and that's what makes them so great at it, that you can actually break them to set them free to be all that the horse is supposed to be. Or you could just break them and break their spirit, and they're afraid to do anything, and they're not, they don't even know their own strength anymore. They're neither fast or effective. And to hear this rancher say, oh, I can just tell by looking at it, just the countenance of it. And I'm like, Jim, this is honestly something. He goes, oh, he goes, you have the most precious daughter in the world. He was so, they were so great with Emma. He says, oh, no, we love her to death. Don't break her spirit. Wow, parent. For us, for a player on the sports team, yeah, I I know. I know the value of correcting, but not to the point where it breaks their spirit. 
encourage, build up, build, keep correcting. We have to correct. Build up, encourage. The first point in the notes is the power of encouragement. The second is the significance of encouragement. A wise person once said, flatter me, and I may not believe you. Criticize me, I may not like you. Ignore me, I may not forgive you. Encourage me, and I'll never forget you. The significance of encouragement. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn over to Acts. Nothing could be said on the topic of encouragement without mentioning this one particular character. It's Acts chapter 11. Let's start with Acts 4. Acts 4, 34. You can't say anything without pointing out one guy. This guy was so important. So we see in Acts 4, 34, it says, there was not a needy person among them, talking about how the church was coming together, and many of them were owners of lands and houses. They sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, laid at the apostles' feet, distributed to each as needed. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. This is Barnabas. That's what he's known for. They called him that. That's how much he was known for that. Now look over to Acts chapter 11. And I may switch us again. I'm going to switch us to Acts chapter 9, 26. There's only three passages that really deal with Barnabas much with his personality. Look at Acts 9, 26. And when he'd come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. This is Saul. This is the guy who's been tracking down and killing as many Christians as he possibly could. He's being commended for it. He's being paid well for it. Has a conversion, so they say. So he'd come to Jerusalem, attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Look what literally happened. This is the guy that wrote eventually 13 books of the New Testament. He shows up to see the disciples And he says, you know, hey, I've changed. They're not opening the door. Good for them. (laughs) They're not stupid. They're like, I know who you are. And Barnabas, and I circled the three words and then colored it in, but Barnabas took him, brought him, and declared to them. Barnabas went over to Saul and took him in, and then brought him. And then what I love, Barnabas is the one that told the story. I mean, this is incredible. This is the Apostle Paul, the beginning, like the first experience, and he's not even the one talking. This is incredible. Barnabas is the one. It's like, okay, listen, come here. Just, just lay low here, would you? I got you. And he did. So he takes him in, and he's the one that tells the story. Because it says, and declared, brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he'd seen the Lord, how he spoke to him, how on the Damascus road he told the story of Paul while Paul is standing there in front of everybody. And they're like, bring him in. I I guess he's good. And Barnabas, well, someday we'll see the scene. We could type it in and see it on a big screen in heaven. I'd like to see when they went in how the group moved. 
because I have a feeling that Barnabas slipped off to the side a bit, grabbed a bagel and something to drink, and let them talk. Because from then on, uh, Barnabas did a lot. I mean, he's an amazing character. But he did his thing. Now talk amongst yourselves. I got you in. This is remarkable. He's actually known as the son of encouragement. Yeah, I, I think it's based a lot on how we were raised. If you were raised in a real critical environment where your acceptance was based on you doing things right, many of you can't raise your hand right now because there's family in the room, it's those of us like that that struggle with pointing things out that are negative all the time. It's normal. You had very little encouragement as a young person. You were just told when you stepped out. And now you're trained to think that way. Well, the Scriptures say, no, train otherwise. Be an encourager of people. If you have to count, you want to say something negative so bad, you start a list. You get your nine affirmations in first. So that we'll know it's coming because you'll send like text after, hey, just want you to know you're the best. Hang in there. Thinking of you, praying for you, you're amazing. That's two. We'll know it's coming because on the ninth one, we know the next one's going to be negative. I don't know how you do it except that we go close to the Lord because the Lord is encouraging to us. Remember the love? It's the love from the Father to the Son and the Son to us. Go to Him. He's not critical of you. Oh, but you feel like He is, don't you? Because of the way you were raised, you're hearing His critical nature to you. You're not even hearing the encouragement from Jesus because you never had it. So you're taking all of this. Every time you open the Bible, it's what else do I have to do? What else am I doing wrong? Right? It's because that's how you are raised and you're interpreting God that way. God is not that way. That is not the way he is. When you open up your word and you go into prayer and you've done uh, plenty of things today that you shouldn't have and had thoughts that you hadn't thought, you open the word, he goes, you, come here. I love you. Yeah, but I, I come here. Come here. I love you. We don't change to spend time with Jesus. We spend time with Jesus, and he produces change within us. Amen? That's how it is. And we pass that on to others. But we have trouble passing that kind of positive encouragement and acceptance of people. We have trouble with that because we have trouble finding our acceptance in God the way we are. You're not good enough. <laughs> That's never been a debate. <laughs> You've never been good enough. <laughs> so <laughs> relax. Oh, I've sinned in my life. We know. Everybody does. But I disobeyed him today. I know, everybody did. That's why Jesus was sent as a sacrifice, just as you are receiving Jesus Christ for salvation, because he loves you just the way you are. And then he brings you in and he moves you, with you, to where you need to be. At the age of seven... This young man had to go to work to support his family. Two years later, his mom died. At age 22, he lost a decent job as a store clerk. A year later, he went in partnership with a friend and went into pretty heavy debt. 
and three years later, his partner died, left him with all the debt. At 35, he thought he'd take a run at Congress, and he failed twice. At one point, he wrote in a journal, and you can read it even to this day, about depression, and it couldn't, he couldn't see any reason to keep going with his life. But he did. His faith was strong, but he was encouraged, just keep going. Age 37, he won an election to Congress. Two years later, he lost re-election. At 41, his four-year-old son died. One year later, rejected for position as a land officer. Two years after that, ran for Senate, lost. Ran for Senate again and lost. Then at the age of 51, became President of the United States. During his, pre during his presidency, of course, civil war. During his second term, assassinated. Uh, how, does, how does a person keep going? Abraham Lincoln, in his law office, his partner would go in and see this tall, skinny frame curled over, cowering in a corner. And the partner knew, just turn around and leave. You're going to have to just let him live that out. There's a president of the United States who couldn't carry a pocket knife. Did you know that? Because he would use it on himself. How, how does this How does this? With a, with a figure that we look up to as one of the greatest figures in American history. How does he do that? And I think it's so representative of all of us. You and I all have issues and we all have things that we're struggling with, things that will just make you, the rest of us cry because you're facing, and we're so sorry for that. And if we could view one another with that kind of a lens... Yeah, you did those eight things wrong. That's right. Yeah, we'll point them out. We'll talk about it. I just want to encourage you. Just keep going. Keep going. I want you to know I'm always here for you, and I want to take you out and just sit with a coffee and not even say a word and just sit there with you. Figure out ways to authentically encourage people because we're in desperate need of it today. We have young people facing things that I can't even imagine as much as I think I've gone through a few things in my life, I see what they're going through, and I'm like, I don't know how you keep going. I see people turning to alcohol, and I'm like, yeah, I'll have one with you because it's bad. Like, this is horrible. But there is an answer. And the answer isn't alcohol. And every other vice that we attempt to cover up and if we viewed each other that way, I, I don't, because you don't see it. You can't see it. Hindsight, Lincoln, oh, you can see it. Yeah, you can see it. There's a book called Lincoln's Depression. I mean, it is unbelievable, and you see it in his countenance. That is not true for most people. They look happy. They're content. Look at their life. It's perfect. No, their life is horrible because you didn't get to see the things that they saw, experience the things, which is why it's the third point, which is why the ultimate act of encouragement, the ultimate act is me and you bringing the salvation story of Jesus Christ in the life of somebody. That, that's it. That is, you've just topped it. Because we have all sinned. We are all in sin. And we are hopelessly lost. And I don't know what the world's going to do to somebody and how it's going to chew them up. I don't understand any of that. I do know that Jesus Christ was sent as salvation for anyone who believes in him. And that's what brings the ultimate source of encouragement. The ultimate source of hope. Do you know Lincoln was one of the few that didn't, go to, didn't have a declared church? I don't know, some of you historians, maybe the only president 
There may have been another one or two. Did you know that? Didn't have a church. It's because it's not about church. How do you have that when a guy is so devout in his relationship with God, in his writings, there's a vibrancy there? It's because it's not about church. Churches can help. I hope our church helps. But that isn't the source of encouragement. It's relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, the ultimate encouragement. You guys familiar with the author Philip Yancey? Philip Yancey is one of my favorites. Um, uh, Jimmy Carter says he was his favorite modern day author, Philip Yancey. His book, What's So Amazing About Grace, is, I think, one of the greatest books on grace. He recalled a very good friend of his. He refers to as his alcoholic friend said this, when I'm late to church, people turn around and stare at with me with frowns of disapproval. I get the clear message that I'm not responsible as they are. But when I'm late to an AA meeting, <laughs> that comes, the meeting comes to a halt and everyone jumps up and gives me a big hug to welcome me because they realize that my lateness may be a sign that I almost didn't make it. And when I show up, it proves that my desperate need for them won out of my desperate need for alcohol. Isn't that the spirit? And I'm going to tell you, I really mean it. This verse today is extremely fitting for this congregation. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing if there is a congregation that fits the end of the sentence as much as the commending them to be a certain way, it's you. The warmth of this. I've had, you know this, I have people sharing me their opinions on everything of a church service and churches and what they do, and they don't like, like the meet and greet, and I get it. I, yeah, you may not, but this is a church that actually does it because they want to do it. It's not a time filler. We actually want to meet and greet people. When you walk in that door, that smile of good morning, how are you, is actually, am I not right? Is that not an authentic good morning, how are you? That anyone who says that to you and you say, you know what, I just need a minute. I just, could, could someone talk? To, that same person go, yeah, come on. It's a chance to not hear that guy speak. Come on, let's talk for an hour. It's like win-win. Because it's on our minds. Encourage one another and build one another up just, just as you've been doing in encouragement. And even as we end the service today, there'll be folks right over here available to pray with you. They would love to pray with you. It might be, I don't even know why I want prayer. I just want you to pray with me because we want to encourage. We want to build up. The odds are, with the number of people in here, there are some really kind of at the edge. Stress of things, the anxiety is getting to be too much. I want you to know that we are all here for you. We love you. And no greater love than Jesus Christ who gave himself for you. He loves you. Turn to him. Turn to one of us. We would love to encourage you. Walk that road with you. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time this morning. Uh, we love you so much. You are an encouragement. For the ones struggling today, the sound of my voice, whether online or in this room, I pray they reach out. God, I pray that we would reach to them first. Make us aware of people around us. Make us aware of who we need to be encouraging. And we do this in fulfillment of your scriptures that tell us to encourage one another. In Jesus' name, amen.